Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, Mikael. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming super early. Uh, it's early Sunday morning. It's more difficult getting out of bed, bed than usual. Um, so yes, I will be talking about uh, writing tests that stand the test of time. Uh, that's a quite a cheesy title, but what I'm going to be talking about are tips that can help you write more maintainable tests. If you've ever found yourself in a position where, um, okay, yes, let's start doing TDD, so we start writing tests, uh, but every time you have to modify your code, you also have to modify the test, and then you're starting to wonder if it's really worth um, having this test, um, this talk is for you. Also, if you're not convinced about test-driven development, if it's even helpful, if it's as good as they claim it is, um, then this talk is also for you. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'll be talking about those things. Uh, brief introduction, um, my name is Shegun. I'm from Nigeria, but I live in Dusseldorf, Germany. Um, I recently became a Google developer expert, like he said. Um, I like to paint in my spare time, uh, practice karate and sometimes run. Um, so that's a little about me. You can find me almost everywhere on the internet as, as Shegun Famisa. Um, so in the course of this talk, I'll be talking about uh, a brief introduction to test-driven development. I'll be doing, talking about the problems with test-driven development from my experience, uh, what were the things that almost made me give up writing tests. Uh, I'll also be talking about some important tools that can help you write more maintainable tests and how to use those tools to write these tests. And then we'll do a quick recap and that will be all. So what's test-driven development? According to this quote on Martin Fowler's blog, it's a technique for building software that guides software development by writing tests. Another entry on Wikipedia is, says that TDD is a software development process that relies on the repetition of a very short development cycles. Requirements are turned into specific test cases and the software is improved to pass the new tests. This is a, a lot of words. Um, but I did like a word cloud of some things that I found important about the meaning of test-driven development. And one of them is specific test cases. It means that in test-driven development, and also when I'm saying tests in this case, I loosely mean um, unit tests. So you're testing specific cases in your project, like uh, if a user clicks this button, a certain thing happens. So it's a specific code in your, it's a specific scenario or use case in your, in your project. And also it guides the development cycle. So it helps, uh, development happens in phases and test-driven de development itself is supposed to help you through the cycle of development. And there's repetition, which means you pretty much do the same thing over and over in little steps. And writing tests, which is um, pretty obvious as it can get. So. Uh, typically, how does one do TDD? Um, by the way, there's going to be a lot of buzzwords in this presentation, uh, so prepare for that. Uh, hopefully, I will be uh, relating to the buzzwords to things you, we already do. Uh, that's one thing I really don't like too much about being a developer. There are so many buzzwords, they're like, what is this? And then they tell you the meaning and you find out, oh yes, I do that already. Um, I, I think that will be the case uh, mostly, mostly today. So how do we do TDD? Uh, there's this popular thing about red-green refactor. Um, it's like the TDD mantra. It says that you write a failing test first. And this means that before you even start to write your code, you first write a test. Before you test a class, you already, before you create a class, you already write the test. It's definitely not going to compile because the class doesn't even exist yet. Um, so you first write the failing test, and then you write just enough code to pass that test. So if the first test you wrote was creating an instance of the class that you don't have yet, that doesn't even compile, 
then the, the green step will be to actually create the class so that the test compiles now. And then the next step will be to clean up. Uh, will be to, I don't know, move the class to the correct package or add your braces or do something to clean up the, the mess we just created. And then you go back to write the next failing step. You call the method you want to test. The method doesn't exist yet. So you go back to the actual class and you add the method. And then it compiles again. And then you clean it up. Maybe you move it to the correct section. And then you go back to your test to write another test that's going to fail. Basically, this is the uh, step of this is the cycle of test-driven development, and it goes on, on, and on, and on for little, in little steps. So TDD, um, in short, is you don't write a new code until you've written a test that fails, and you don't write more code than is needed to pass that test, and then you repeat. That's like the simple um, story behind TDD. OK. So why exactly do we need these tests? Uh, in my experience, I found that having tests gives um, quick, quick feedback about bugs and errors. Um, many companies or many of our teams have dedicated quality assurance um, people that help you to check the project before releasing to the users. Um, but most times, they find a bug that you're, instead of adding to, you add for. And then they say, no, this is not correct. And then you have to go back. They create a bug ticket. Then you have to work on the bug ticket. You have to raise a pull request uh, that will get reviewed. Then you have to take it again for the uh, QA process. And that could be an incredibly long process. And there are a lot of these bugs and errors that could be caught by writing tests. So in my opinion, tests uh, help you to shorten the feedback process from when you get an error to when you get to fix them. Another interesting point is that TDD helps to implement good code design. Um, because you actually, you're starting on a green, clean slate. You don't have, um, when you're writing tests, you already you have the entire picture in mind. Because you have to write the test first. So you actually know what you're about to do. So it kind of helps you to um, implement good code design. You already detect things that are not nice by writing the test first, because you don't actually write the code and say, hmm, this is not nice. Let's change this. You actually find out early while writing tests. Another interesting thing is that it serves as a documentation for the behavior of your code. Usually, when I want to work on a project, I usually look at the tests to see what the general behavior of this class I'm looking at is. OK, if, if it's a repository, for example, then we say, I just look at the test and look at the test names and say, oh, OK, this is what this does. Uh, it helps to document the code behavior. And as the requirements changes for the project, then you see the test cases also changing to reflect the new requirements for the product. So it's a really good source of documentation. Another interesting thing is, uh, this one has, is so personal for me, is confident refactoring. Um, there are a lot of times when uh, you di discover that your code isn't uh, good enough. Uh, that happens to me all the time. Like code I wrote 20 minutes ago already starts looking, hmm, what was I trying to do? And then I decide to refactor. Uh, a lot of times I break things and then I change the behavior of my class. Of the, of the class, and then I'm wondering what happened. But when I have tests, I discover that I could just change it, and I know it's still going to work if my tests pass. So it's given me a lot of confidence in refactoring my code. And indeed, this is one of the promises of test-driven development, that you're able to confidently refactor your, uh, your code. OK, so now we know why we need to do TDD. Uh, if TDD is so nice, why isn't everyone doing it? Uh, or why do some people give up? Or why are you considering giving up? First thing is, to be honest, it takes time. That's the honest truth. Uh, it's, 
tests are actually code too, so you spend time writing them. And sometimes some people are not convinced that this time is actually worth it. But in my, in my personal experience, I found that the test, the time you spend writing tests, are actually investments that will benefit you in the long run. Um, for example, if you have a new developer on your team that's finding it difficult to understand the whole project, they could just look at your, they could read your tests to understand what's going on in the entire project. And I think that's really important. Um, so it's an investment in the long run. Another big issue, which is kind of like what my talk today is centered around, is maintenance overhead. Um, first, what do I mean by maintenance? So a test, uh, test driven development becomes a problem when all tests break really often. So you make a small change in your code and all the tests start failing. You're like, what's going on? Should I fix the test or should I delete it? I almost deleted a test last week because it was failing all the time and I really don't know why. Um, so test-driven development, when it's not done correctly, it brings uh, maintenance overhead uh, where you have old tests breaking often or it's difficult to add new tests or you're not even sure if this scenario has already been tested. Um, the, more your te the more your code grows, the more your tests grow and then the more confusing it gets in general, especially if you don't structure things well. Another uh, very frequent uh, problem that I face is that sometimes my tests are too tightly coupled to the production code. Production code in this case means the actual code that I'm deploying, not the test. So it means everything except the test code. Sometimes I find that if I change something in the test, in the, in the real code, then I have to change the same thing in the test. And that has become a problem because instead of changing things once, you end up changing it twice in the code and in the test, which goes against the, all the benefits that people, everyone says uh, test-driven development gives. So um, I've discovered some important tools uh, that have helped me personally write more maintainable tests, and I'm going to talk about some of them. The first one is test doubles. Um, test doubles are like stunt doubles in movies, like uh, the Dragon Queen and Thor. I don't know who is who. I don't even recognize the real one. So test doubles are like stunt doubles in movies where a fake person, not, not fake, another person that looks like the real person replaces the actual actor and we all don't notice in the movies. So also in the test, in testing we have the same concept. We use some objects which are not really the real objects but they look like the real objects and we use them in our tests. The times when we need this is uh, especially when the real objects are expensive to use or it's not realistic to use. For example, if you're writing a test and you have to make network requests, which could take, I don't know, one minute or two minutes to, to run depending on the network condition. So you don't want to spend so much time waiting for your network request to go through and things like that. So you probably want to use a test double at that point. Also some other scenarios, for example, what if you're on a plane and you want to write tests? You, you're on a 24-hour flight from Australia to San Francisco or, or something like that, and you want to work on your project in the plane, and you don't have real network, so you're not able to write your test because you don't have internet service. So we're able to use, there are tons of cases where we need to use test doubles in our tests as opposed to the real implementation of these classes. But there are a lot of uh, the test doubles. Uh, we have things like dummies, stubs, fakes, mock spies. Uh, this is related to this talk because it, to write maintainable tests, we need to really understand the test doubles and be able to use the correct ones. Uh, in my personal experience, it's helped me to really understand when to use which test double in order to be able to 
writers that are not tightly coupled to my production code. And I'm going to be talking about this uh, test doubles. First one is dummies. Uh, dummies are just filler objects. I actually prefer to call, if they called them filler objects instead of dummy objects because they actually don't do anything. They just fill constructor parameters or method parameters. They never, your code never interacts with, the method you're te testing never interacts with that particular parameter. You just put it there so that the code compiles. And that's all they do. The other one is stubs. This way it gets interesting. So a stub is an object that returns a predefined data. So for example, um, if you have a class, a dependency of the class you're testing, and you, it returns something, but the real implementation gets that thing from the API network or from the database, and you don't want to do all of that because you're testing something else. You could just make a stub of that to return exactly what you expect. Uh, we'll still look at a real example soon. So they usually don't respond to other actions beside the exact one you um, asked it to do. So you say, give me this, um, return this user if I call get user, for example. So you already know what exactly you want, and it doesn't interact with any other state in the, in the class. So let's look at an example. Let's say we have a repository that um, we can use to get user, to add user, to delete a user from, I don't know, a database or something. Um, so the real implementation looks like this. Uh, it uses a user data access object, which runs the SQL queries or uh, something to find the user by ID. So, in this user repository, it goes to the user DAO, and the user DAO goes to the database, and we run the SQL queries, and then return the user back to the repository, which then takes it back to whoever is calling. This is the real class. But we want to write a test for the user, uh, that uses the user repository, but we don't want it to go to the database, because I don't know, how long does it take to get a database thing running and then having to shut it down after the test. And you want quick feedback when writing tests. So instead, we use a stub. And when we create the stub, we just pre-configure a user that has the ID one and the email, and say whenever we, every time we call get user with, on this stub, it returns this particular user that I already know that I, that I have uh, predefined, that I have hard-coded. Um, this is how we use stubs. Another interesting uh, test double is fakes. Uh, fakes are like stubs, but they are more realistic in the sense that um, for, the, for, the stub that we, for the stubs that we talked about, we just hard code things. We don't modify any internal state. For example, what if the a previous test had called add user before get user. Does it return the same user? What if I remove the user? If I call get user, will I still get the actual user? Um, the fakes in this, on this hand, they respond to state changes. And they usually contain working implementation that are different from the real one. Let's uh, Look at an example. So we have, if we have an in-memory database, uh, we, the real database is maybe SQLite or SQL or Microsoft's SQL Server or something. And if we're writing tests, we don't, de we definitely do not want to spin up uh, an actual database connection and have to go through all of that thing. Instead, we create an in-memory database that we are able to save stuff, retrieve stuff. Um, run queries, not really run them, but act as if we're running queries and things like that. So it's more realistic than a stop, where we just say, when we call this, give us this. Not when we call this, find, actually find this user. Uh, let's look at an example. So the user DAO that we were talking about uh, previously, the real class uh, runs DB queries, um, but the fake class in this case um, has a list that it uses, so when we add a user to the, in the fake, 
We don't actually add it to the database, but we just add it to a list that we keep in the fake. And then when we find by ID this time around, we don't just return a hard-coded user. We actually find the user in the list, in the backing list. So here there is the backing data source here is a list and not a database as it would be in the real implementation. And their functions actually interact with the backing data. And this is easy, this is fast, this is all in memory, and it all goes away after your test runs. You don't have to do any special setup or teardown process to free up uh, system resources. Uh, so that's fake. Now the next one is mocks. This is probably the most popular one and the most controversial one as well. Uh, if the, anyone using mocks here, mock all the things, yay, go. Cool. So mocks are like the objects that are pre-programmed with expected inputs, expected output for certain inputs. That's when you start to see things like when when I tell this, when I call this method on this object, then return this, then answer this. That's mocks for you. So mocks have this interesting ability. They are able to record method calls. So if you call this method, they're able to re record the interaction. And it, at a later time in your project, you can verify that the interaction that you expected was actually called. This is both a blessing and a curse, as we will see very soon. These mocks are able to throw exceptions if an expected um, method is not called. Also, they're implemented differently in different programming languages. There are numerous libraries out there. There is different mocking framework for JavaScript. There are different mocking frameworks for Python, for .NET, for C Sharp, for Java, for Kotlin. There are different libraries that have their own implementation, but the, the principle is the same across all of these libraries. They record interactions, they're able to verify, they're able to throw exceptions if your expected interactions do not happen. So let's look at an example usage of mocks. Let's say we have a notification service that uh, we want to send a notification to a group of users. Uh, our notification service takes in a notification client that we actually use to send the notification and a group repository that we use to find the users that we want to send the uh, notifications to. And then when we post a new notification, we batch send, we find a group, we find the users of that group and we batch send the notification. Uh, fairly simple class here. If you wanted to test that we send batch notifications to the user, the first thing we would typically do is create a mock. Um, the syntax here might be different from the programming language you use. Uh, the, the, code slab, the code samples are in Kotlin, uh, but it's fairly, I think it's really readable for anyone. So it might be slightly different in your um, programming language, but it, the concepts are the same. So first you create a mock, and then you set the expectations. This is the special um, characteristic of mocks. And you say things like, whenever I call this mock with this method, then return this object or something like that. So it's a typical step to use mocks. If you, don't, if you have a mock and you don't do this with your mock, there is going to be a problem. Either your test doesn't work as expected or it doesn't even um, run. It, fails at runtime. Then, the typical way of testing with a mock is that you verify interactions. Uh, that's the normal flow with mocks. Another interesting test double is um, spy. Um, they're like, it's like a hybrid between stops and mocks. Uh, spies are kind of real objects but they are also like mocks because they can verify um, interactions, they record interactions with them. At the same time, they are almost real. So if you really need um, something real that you can verify behavior on, then you probably need a spy in your tests. 
So now that we've uh, looked at the test doubles, which is like the core of my talk today, uh, it would be nice to look at actual tips for writing maintainable tests, which is why we're here. Um, in my opinion, uh, maintainable tests are tests that are reliable, that don't fail this minute and pass the next minute. So they're really reliable and you know that, yeah, this thing is working as expected. They don't change as often as the production change, production code changes. So a maintainable test is a test that I don't always have to update my test because I changed a small part of my class then it's really maintainable because it becomes a real problem if you have thousands of files and thousands of tests and you change the behavior in one class and you have to update like 15 tests every time you change it. It's, it's as good as not even having tests in the first place because you spend so much time and everyone in the company is angry with you because you're not delivering on time. So in my opinion, maintainable tests do not change as often as the production code changes. Another interesting thing is that maintainable tests fail for only one reason. Uh, there are some times when test fails and we're not even sure why exactly it fails. It says this error, but it passed five minutes ago, so it really can't be this error. So maybe it's another thing. Then you start investigating and you find out, oh yes, I changed this. It's unclear where the, the error fails from, why it fails, because it could fail for more than one reason. When you have that case in your project, then um, you need to start investigating how to improve the test to become more maintainable. Also, when it's difficult to modify old tests, like for example, if you don't really understand the structure of the test, what is this test even testing? I don't even know, it's so complex. There's so much abstraction going on here. I, don't, I can't even read this test. Then there's a problem with the test because it's not really maintainable. If you have a new developer on the team and they're trying to go through the test and the tests are even confusing, how much more will the production code uh, be if they try to read it? So the first tip for me is to use a good test specification system. This is, this is all big words. Basically, it means a consistent test structure. Um, Tested is, the, this concept of TDD is so, um, there's a lot of theory around the topic and then there's so many textbook words, textbook phrases, and good test specification system to me just means a consistent test structure. And this varies from person to person, from team to team. But easily, it means that each test has like at least three processes. One, you set up the dependencies of the test. Then you exercise, that is you call the, you execute the scenario you're actually trying to test. And then you verify and you assert that the things you expect actually happen. Um, this varies from ideology to ideology. Um, some people know this as arrange, act, assert. That's probably what you will find in Uncle Bob's uh, books and things like that. You arrange first, you set up dependencies, you act, you exercise, and you assert, then you verify, same thing. Or if you're used to behavior-driven development, it's given when then. So given the dependencies, when I call this method, then I expect this to happen. To me, it's all the same, they're just fancy words. So, it's good to have the same test specification system across your, all your tests. This gives a very, very consistent and readable flow to your tests. If I, because these days I'm so used to this approach and when I'm reading uh, tests, I, I expect that the first things, the first pieces of code that I'm seeing are setting up the dependencies and then the next part is actually where the thing is being called. And then after that, they're just verifying things. This, it makes things really clear and consistent all across the test. And this is really important for um, good TDD. Another one is test behavior, not implementation details. This is quite controversial and there's been a lot of arguments uh, online. Um, between different groups of people that 
different ideologies and things like that. But to me, testing behavior means that for non-state changing methods, that is methods that return value, when you actually only care about what they return, you don't care about how they return it. So it's, you're not, you don't care, for example, if you're adding, if you're writing a method to add two numbers, you only care about the output. You don't care if they're using the plus operator or they're using a, a, a library to do the addition. We actually don't care. We just want to check that this addition gives the right output. That is this scenario. Let's look at an example. Say we have a use case where um, we have like a user repository and we try to get a user from the cache if it exists. If the user just, if we recently loaded a user from the database, we can load them into a cache and then next time we request the same user, we just pick from the cache instead of going to the database or to the API network. So just like we said in the last step, the first thing is set up the test conditions. We add the network source, we add the cache source, and then we set up the expectations and say whenever I check if this user exists, the user with ID5, then return true. So we're mocking that the user exists. Then when I get this actual user, then return this user with ID5 at email at email.com. The setting of the test conditions. And then we go ahead to exercise the scenario under the test. That is, the, after setting up the conditions, we then exercise the test that we create the user repository and we try to get the user. And when we're using mock, we want to test that the user is from the cache. So definitely the cache source must be called, right? Yeah, so we write this test. Unfortunately, this test, it works, but it's not good enough. Because if we decide to change how the cache source works, uh, for example, if we change I don't know, something in the, maybe from integer it starts taking strings, or we start getting user by email instead of by username, instead of by ID, then this test starts to fail because it tests the implementation details. On the other hand, we can simply check that the data from the user that we retrieve matches what we expect. That is the user ID matches what we set up in the first place. So we set up that the user from the cache has an ID of five. If we're going to test just the behavior, we just want to check that the user that we get has actually the ID of five. So we do not need to verify that we called the, the, the cache source, which is already being tailored to that code flow. So our new test looks like this. Network source, we set up, we exercise and we just assert the values. So this is what I mean when I say non-state changing uh, methods, that is methods that just return a value. You don't need to verify any interactions on those kind of tests. Um, because when you start to do that, then you're starting to test implementation details, which is not a desirable effect. Now, the next one is for state changing methods, you can verify that methods were called during when you are using mocks. So, sorry. So, an example is if we wanted to save a user, the, it's like a set method. It doesn't get any output. It's like a command. We only send an instruction. We don't get any result. So, they actually the only way to know that that, was actu that actually happened was to verify that the mock was called if we're using mocks. If we're using stops, uh, if we're using fakes, we can check that, okay, we should confirm that the internal state has actually been changed. So if we're saving a new user, we should check the list of users that we have in the, in the fake and check that it contains this new user that we just added. That's even better. In my opinion, um, it's advised to use less mocks um, because mock, so th in TDD there is two uh, ideologies. There is classicist and the mockist. The classicist and or the classi classical 
style of testing, they never use mocks. They don't use mocks. Everything is an interface that they can create implementations for fakes and stops. While the mockists think that everything is a mock, mock everything. And the mockists don't see testing, behavior, testing implementation details as a problem. They see it as it's part of life. Uh, so that's uh, that. Another interesting thing is to avoid assertion roulette. Uh, assertion roulette is also another fancy word, and it simply means that when you're asserting so many things like this, uh, when the test fails, we are unsure why exactly it fails. Was it because the username was wrong, or was it because the bio was wrong, or was it because we didn't send a welcome email? We are not sure. To fix that, there is an easy fix. You can add messages to your failures, which is pretty readable. Uh, you just separate the tests. You remove the unrelated uh, assertions into a separate test of its own. If you find yourself having to verify more than two or three things, especially if they are unrelated, then you might be doing assertion roulette. So you want to actually split the test into as many tests as needed. More tips, uh, use expressive test names. I personally don't mind your test names being, I don't know, 25 characters long, really long, as long as they explain. Like, for example, test that user return, we get user from cache if cache exists. That's a really long method name. Um, some people will tell you not to use long method names, but it's a test, it's supposed to be readable. If the test fails, you should be able to tell exactly why it fails, especially if you're working on if your test fails on your continuous improvement, or continuous deployment um, tool, you want to be sure at a glance you can tell why it fails. You should avoid logic in your test, if, else, loops, and so on. And so on. Um, avoid abstraction in tests. Uh, this is also a bit controversial, but my opinion is that tests are meant to be readable, they are documentation, so you don't want to have logic there and the user is finding out what's like, what exactly is happening. Be generous with comments. For me, I always comment everything, given that we have user, given that this user is, a, is able to be fetched from cash, this, this, that, that. It's really helpful for um, future users of your, future readers of your test, including yourself. Um, so a quick recap, we've talked about the benefits of test-driven development, um, the problems that I think come with test-driven development. Um, the marks and the test doubles. And I've shared some tips of, for writing uh, maintainable tests. Uh, there are some resources that are actually uh, nice for further reading. Um, Martin Fowler's X Unit Patterns. Google has a testing blog, which I find really, really nice. I think everyone should check it out. And this blog post from Mr. Lynch, yes, I think he wrote it two days ago. I found it really nice. It's about why good developers write bad tests. I think everyone should check that blog out and Dudo Library for providing nice icons for free. You can also use them in your presentations. So thank you very much.